Okay, here we go. Nice and quiet. Sound speeds, camera rolling. Holding for sound. Last looks. Calling for last looks. And set and action. I need to swap batteries. You know, making movies is hard. Making movies is hard. Welcome to Making Movies is Hard, a podcast about the struggle of being an independent filmmaker. I'm Mark Bissell. I am Liz Manichel. This week we have writer, producer, director, and actor Leah McKendrick on the show. You know, nobody needs to pay me. This is a dream for me. And the money was really never even a thing at all. I would have done it for free. I would have paid them <laughs> to get to do it. Leah is on the show to talk to us about the making of her feature film, MFA, which was her first feature as producer, writer, and co-star alongside Francesca Eastwood and the tough decision she had to make to get that film made, uh, which is a really awesome, amazing conversation, I have to say. Um, and you know, kind of (laughs) gut-wrenching as a filmmaker, too. She also talks about her rise as a writer and what it was like to do a rewrite on the film Summer Lovin', which is like the prequel to Grease, written by Hollywood screenwriter and podcasting legend John August. So that is another, like, totally, holy shit, amazing thing. Um, And then lastly, we talked a little bit about her newest DC fan film, uh, Pamela and Ivy, where she directs and stars as the iconic DC villain, Poison Ivy, which we didn't really talk about enough, uh, be, you know, especially considering how good it is. Um, I don't know if you've we seen it. We hadn't watched it at that point. I mean, I think she sent us the link after the recording, No, right? it, Yeah, it came out after. Um, and so that's, I pre- think, one of the reasons why we didn't talk about it. And also, there's just so many other things to talk about with <laughs> Leah. And there's probably other things that we didn't even talk about with her that we could have talked to her about because she's got so much going on. There's like a whole 20 minute conversation about that short film to be had because um, it's pretty awesome. And I think it was really cool what she did with it and the direction she went. It was kind of a bold direction and it works so well. And I think it's got like, you know, well over 50,000 hits at this this time online, which is just fantastic. Fun fact about Leah. Her name was inspired by the Dottie Irish song, Oh, Leah, which is a (laughs) badass, but also like sassy song that she has to carry around with her for her. I like like it's an amazing theme song to enter a room with is what I'm saying. Um, And that's my favorite fun fact about Leah. (laughs) Awesome. Well, yeah. And then I think you should do the honors, uh, Liz. Oh, to segue into network. I think you should. Well, we should talk about what's happening in the world. Listen to me. Television is not the truth. We'll tell you anything you want to hear. We lie like hell. This week, uh, we have some new protocols that have been released for filming in a joint effort between a few unions. Um, I think this is SAG, AFTRA, DGA, and the Teamsters all came together to to put out this. Oh, I guess it's a new white paper or it's a addition to the white paper that was already released or something, but it's just a bunch of information of like what we should be doing when we go back to work, which now officially we can apparently like that's like a thing, but it just sort of depends on County to County on like what they're allowing and what people do, you know? Um, and so rather than go through this article and talk about all the things the article said, I just want to ask you, Liz, like what, are you seeing like are your friends and colleagues going back to uh, making movies or going back to work or are you or like no one you know is it the same deal like everyone's still locked down well here's like a, my update is my friend jill who whose name does not whose last name doesn't ever want to be disclosed on the show for ah. some reason she was one of our player of the weeks uh players of the week she um she got called into she's working on a big budget studio film and she is moving to atlanta for eight months to get back into production on it and that's happening at the end of june so uh yes people i know are getting back into production in terms of indie people no in fact our friend friend of the show uh whose name maybe we shouldn't mention he's decided to like put filmmaking on the back burner for like indefinitely because he yeah i mean he's concentrating solely on his podcast right now and on editing and supporting other projects because of this concept of like as indie productions how are how are we going to move forward right so i'm seeing both things both sides of the coin right now So in my little world of the Bay Area, um, people are going back to work. Like I did my first corporate job um, about a week ago, which was like, you know, what you'd imagine, like me and uh, one client and the subjects. It was like, you know, three people in the room, basically. And I had like 
masks and gloves and every disinfectant spray you could imagine and all like the stuff and like, you know, wiping down uh, the lavalier mic before I put it on the table and then get six feet away for the the talent to come in and mic themselves, you know, like all that stuff. And we had um, producers from New York and director from New York in through Zoom. So they did all the directing and producing through the Zoom call. So it was just a bunch of voices coming in through my laptop and then one face looking at the subject so that they could like have someone to talk to during the interview and then me with my camera. And, uh, you know, I had to get a bunch of new equipment to do all this and everything. And, um, you know, now we have it all and own it all so we can do it whenever we need to. But um, it was definitely a different experience. Uh, but then a bunch of the crew from my movie all did a big job this last week. They did like what? a, yeah, like a three day commercial in a studio with a 25 person crew. And I was like, wait, how the fuck did that happen? And they're like, I don't know. I was like, do they get permits? And then they're like, I think maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay. And then they're like, yeah. And they talked about all the things they did. And it was very much what we've been talking about for the last uh, couple of months. It was temperature checks at the door and then at lunch and then um, in the afternoon. So three times a day, temperature, che- temperature checking. It was staggered call times. Uh, it was social distancing. And then they had a limit of 10 person, 10 people on the stage at one time. So there was, while well, there was a 25 person crew, there was only 10 people allowed to be on the set at any given time. And then uh, actors had to wear face masks in between takes, which was like, you know, really, really terrible, uh, the DP was saying, for uh, time because and for hair and makeup because they constantly had to adjust hair and makeup every time they would take the mask off. So they take the mask off, then the hair and makeup crew has to run out the set, do their redo it, do their touch ups and then, you know, go fly out again. And the touch ups obviously take way longer than regular touch ups because, you know, they had a mask over their face and, you know, on their head or whatever. Um, so they just said it t- took a lot longer. Um but they love going back to work and it seems viable and, you know, no one died or got sick or anything. So, wow. well, I don't it's know. only been a week. We have to wait another yeah, week to find that, out. That's right? true. That's true. But anyways, the point is like, you know, it feels like it's feasible and it's kind of all on, to me. It seems like it's all on what your crew is comfortable with and what the person running the production is comfortable with, you know, mm-hmm. like, cause if you just do that in your own private, uh, you know, property or your location that you own where you don't necessarily have to get permits if you're in the Bay area, I know LA is different. You have to get permits for everything, but, um, you know, you definitely can pull this off. And if, and for guerrilla filmmaking, it definitely raises the question that, Oh, you could really pull off a lot of things if you just do it on your own. Um, the SF, film restrictions they just came out with a new uh list last week or the week before but it was like now it it changed and now you have to have uh you could have 12 people on set now and then actors have to have face masks on at all times indoors but they're allowed to take them off outdoors um you know just for the take but they they can't take them off indoors yet according to the um policy that's been set forth by sf film so they Which, just encourage outdoor scenes. Is that basically, the idea? Okay. yeah, or like that you can't have a scene with a person's face face mask on indoors, which doesn't make any sense, and is like kind of how, like you have to do a shoot. Like our our talent for my shoot had their face didn't have a face mask on because they're fucking the person on the screen. Right. You know, we're we're not making a COVID documentary here. Right. It's <laughs> just just a corporate video. Um. So I don't know. I I kind of it made me really optimistic and hopeful. And I was talking to my producer and he's got a, a film that he's planning to shoot in the fall. And so, wow, I don't know. It's just like, I think things are going to happen. I think like all the naysayers and the people who are, you know, spouting doom and gloom, I think they're going to be, me. yeah, I, those are, <laughs> those are my people. My prediction is that you're going to be shooting your movie September, October, maybe sooner, but around <laughs> then. And that, People are going to be making movies um, in the fall. That that is just my uh, prediction, and I don't not sure if it's going to be true for every, you know, county or for across the country because I know other areas are having a harder time than than some. Like Bay Area is doing pretty good, uh, from my understanding. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But you know, again, like always, I am the forever op- optimist. But I mean, what what do you think of all this, Liz? I mean, does this seem is this encouraging to you or do you think that this is all just going to like, is this a flash of the pan and that we're going to be locked down in, in a month again? 
I just it's so funny how in, in such different places we are um because the <laughs> the infection rate in LA is still very I mean I don't know if the rate's very high but our instances are higher than SF Bay Area for sure like immensely uh we have many more people who have who have had COVID down here um we just mandated uh use of the you have to wear a mask outside no matter what right, right. now we have uh, that too okay so that was just like last week for us um, uh, okay so that was like new so it made me feel like things were getting wor- worse uh. um and in terms of our production, we're talking in a very like hypothetical terms right now. We we certainly don't have dates, and we just got rejected by the to the one from the one real offer that we sent out. Oh, um, yeah, sorry, just, Liz. It's okay. Sorry, it was oh, God, it's such a bummer when it happens. How, how big was the talent on a scale from you know like let's say ABC? What where were they? In I was that? thinking B. I think B level. Okay. Though I okay. So like for me, A is like. Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt <laughs> Helen Mirren. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of Denzel. I mean, Denzel Washington is like a plus, you know. Right, but right, like, of course. Uh, and then B. I'm I'm trying not to say this person's name, so I'm not going to. But it's like either a good level of fame from indie films or like regular television actor. Um, mm-hmm. I still think that's a weird hierarchy. So this. What about like is, yeah, Dom Hill Gleason? Where is that person? Is that an A person or is that a B person? Like a A minus B plus. Okay. <laughs> because I don't think he's really broke out completely where he's going to be. You know what I mean? I right, think he's going right. to keep growing. Like, I think he'll end up in A. He's just not there yet. Right, right, right. Well, so would you say this person is a little like bit. A B, solid B. A B, a solid B. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I kind of want you to name one more person who you think a B is just so I can, like, have an idea of, like, what a B is. <laughs> Okay, and I, I don't want to offend anyone who's like, I mean, this person's not listening, so they're not going to be offended. Um, who's another B? A B is like uh, Merritt Weaver. Merritt Weaver is one of the best actresses around in general, like point blank. But would you know her name walking down the street? Probably not, but she's had, I don't even know who that is. <laughs> okay, so she's a series regular on that show with Don Hall Gleason. She has an Emmy. Um, she's a fabulous actress, but people don't know her name. So I'm, I say B because, or me, I still think she's gettable and quality, but I'm going to reevaluate this in like five years. I'm going to be like, why the that hell did I funny. call Barrett Weaver a B? Because uh, I, I think like, you know, um, you know, someone who's a B is like someone whose name you still recognize. They're just not necessarily like at the top of the list like um this guy's a b this from this definition this guy's a b yeah like uh, tyrese gibson or something maybe that's even a c but uh you know um yeah it's tough because it's <laughs> are you evaluating them in terms of a commercial appeal like for me it's like gettableness that's what my world is it's like uh i think i could only get b and below but but i didn't anyway this guy said no <laughs> it's fine <laughs> Um, I, I feel like I should quit while I'm like behind. Yes, I'm definitely yes, not ahead. Um, so uh, yeah. Anyway, point being, um, yeah, we're speaking very hypothetically. We've kind of stalled a lot of our progress. We st- we are like in a we were making puppets and we kind of put a pause in the puppet making for a few weeks. Like we're just a little lost right now. So I love the idea that fall's gonna happen um, in your eyes, and I think. Um, I should just trust you. Do you feel like you're waiting for like you're going to make another offer to another actor and that is going to be the thing that's going to like, you know, get you to to set dates and stuff or. Yeah, nothing's ever real for me until you really have a few attachments. Yeah, just a few. You have one, right, that you like, but you're like and you can't say who that is, obviously. No, but she won't officially say she's attached until until like we've proven until. Yeah, okay. until like we and she needs to get like a B or that, better, like, so basically. Like I think she'd be C happy with a C, honestly. Oh, really? Yeah, oh. but it, like, would we be better? Like, you now we have to think of like what's right, going to make her happy right. versus what's best for the film, and also like, you know, like I just want to work with good actors, but I have my stuffy co-director over here, my partner Sean, <laughs> who like really pushes us, and he's like, you need to push for bigger, push for bigger, over and over again. So we're trying to be very pushy. You are like the queen of getting great actors into low budget <laughs> projects. Like I don't know anyone else who's been able to pull off what you've had. And I, I tell my producer 
about what you did? And he's like, that's not possible. He's like, there's no way that you could get an actor like Bobby Moynihan in a $100,000 projection. It's just not going to happen. Well, it took, it took a, a while, but he did it. But, you, but you've done it twice. Like, yep. you, both your movies have, like, like that level of talent that, you know, you wouldn't expect to be in these budget-sized films in them and doing amazing work. And so it's really Thank something you. to aspire to. Thanks. Um, and, uh, you know, but I mean, it just like I basically pulled the trigger on not doing that on my movie and I don't regret it. I think it was a great decision. It's just I think next time I would definitely want to go more in that direction. Well, I'm going in your direction next is what I decided. Like I did a call out on Twitter. I was like and Facebook. Oh, I was yeah. like, I just want to work on a non-union horror film. I want to make an, an exploitation schlocky horror film. Please. Does anyone have just this script hanging around? Right. I got a lot of emails. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Jeez Louise. <laughs> and, um, I mean, I, I, I'm so slow at reading scripts and it's going to take me a while. But point is, like, I'm going to my next thing is at least I don't know whether it's going to be before Lady Parts or after. It'll probably be way after Lady Parts. But I want to do a non-union film where I'm we're treating everyone well. We're having a safe you know, union-like atmosphere, but we don't have to um, jump through hoops in order to get there. Yeah. And we could yeah. save a little bit of money and maybe that could go to actor salaries rather than, you know, X, Y, and Z, various different things that we have to do in order to get SAG yeah. approval. Um, so that, I, or SAG I'm doing fees. that. Jeez. Yeah, it's, That's it's awesome. insane. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm looking to you, like you're the inspiration for that. It's like, can, can I do that and um, also have creative freedom and make something really fun? The conversation with Bruce was like, you know, like you can have dream logic. You can just yeah. make something for the hell of it. And so I, that's what I want to do next. Awesome. Well, we'll uh, we'll keep on talking about it. I want to hear the progress and hear the scripts you read. And if you find something that you really yeah. love, because uh, that is like I love those kinds of movies, too. It's just like uh, anyways, I think it's about damn time <laughs> so sorry. that uh, we get to uh, You've Got Mail. My breath catches in my chest until I hear three little words. You got mail. A few weeks back, we answered a question from our, one of our listeners, Jonathan Filipko. And now John is back with another question for us. So John says, I have one more general question that I would love to hear your perspectives on. And I'm sure many listeners would too. You guys were talking about the oil well theory this last episode, and of course everyone would love to be able to make enough passive income to fund their creative projects, but many are not that fortunate. So my question is, what are the pros and cons of having a day job in the industry, but not what you want to do, versus making a living doing an unrelated job? For example, I have two friends who make a living editing for networks freelance. However, their goals are not to be editors, but to be content creators. They say that they get drained from working on other people's projects all day and that they'd rather do something outside the industry to make money so they have more drive to focus on their own projects after work. While my friends who have day jobs unrelated to the industry always say that they'd give anything to have a day job in the industry, even if it's not at all what their main focus is. What are your takes on this? It has been my mandate that I find a job with boundaries. So for me, it's not necessarily like I work in the industry because it's my only like my resume is all industry. I couldn't work outside of the industry. They wouldn't hire me. So I'm stuck in the industry, <laughs> but it works out well because it helps with networking, um, which is vital. But also more important than being in the industry or being out is having a job that has concrete hours for me, that has a regular schedule. Mm. For me, it's eight to four. For others, it's nine to five or ten to six because it's the hours in the day that you need to safeguard um, and that in turn will allow you to have the energy to work on other projects. So if you feel you're going to feel creatively drained or emotionally drained at any job, a job is like by nature is like you giving your time to something else and it's not supposed to be super fun. Um, it's it's like it's you're doing a task you're responsible right but what i'm saying is like what's more important is making sure that you're not working 12 to 14 hour days every day because then you're just going to kill yourself trying to feed your creative soul in addition to trying to pay you know your bills that's how i feel i mean this is something i wrestle with all the time because like i've uh, i had a day job for two years um right after i worked on um the francis ford coppola feature i uh you know, was hoping that that feature was going to lead to like more feature work. And then um, I got a, jo a full time job opportunity, like while I was on set for that movie. And I 
basically took it because I had to sort of like, I was like basically a mentor needed me to fill in for him. Uh, what, since he quit and there was like no other real option for this company. So I was like, okay, I'll just do it for like, you know, six months and then six months turned into two years. And then I had this full day job. Um, and it was in the industry. It was like, you know, renting cameras and stuff like working in a rental house. But, uh, you know, just having the day job, like I, basically hardly did anything the whole time and i had access to like red cameras and alexa cameras and all this amazing equipment and like i i used it like once in that two-year time span because i was just so busy and so consumed with the job you know and what then your hours though terrible okay like, so that's like part of it nine to five and i could have been like okay nine to five and then i'm done but like i like if the phone rang at five Uh, for a rental, I would take that rental and turn it out by six, you know, because I wanted the rental department to thrive and to grow. And obviously I had no stake in the company. I had no um, percentage of ownership or anything. I just wanted to do a good job. Um, And I'd I'd set terrible boundaries for myself in that position. And I would often work till midnight or or later um, packing the van for shoots and, Mm. you know, working on the weekends and all kinds of terrible things. And, you know, on a salary, no less which was just stupid. But um, <laughs> anyways, like I, I always thought like, oh yeah, okay. Like, well, you know, I, I'll go freelance. It'll be easier Then my first year of freelance was just as bad. Like I was like completely, you know, whatever, just slammed with work the whole time. And then I it basically, I just had to make like creative stuff a priority in order to get it done. You know, like that was the only way that anything actually worked out, you know, like just to set time aside to do it. And then I often say, to myself like oh man maybe like and then like as, as a freelancer you have to hustle for work right and then you're also like working on your creative projects so then it's like this like weird thing and then I just think like well maybe I should just forget all this and just get like a day job and like work at a pizza place or something and uh I even have a line about this in my movie which is um which is great I love it <laughs> but uh <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I would be able to do it. If I worked at a pizza place again, I used to work at a pizza place. If I was like delivering pizzas or making pizzas for a living, like, would I want to come home and, and work on a, on a feature film? I don't know. But like when I work at like an edit house as an editor for, let's say, like working on some stupid corporate video or for a commercial or whatever it is, like with a, around other creative people, that gets me excited. Like I get excited. Like if I'm riding the bus home after editing for 10 hours, like I will write an idea down for my project or an idea for a different movie. Like I just feel like inspired being around video. So Mm. for me, I don't, I don't think I'd ever want to like actually work at a pizza place and not do a video production related thing. Cause it's the thing I love and it inspires me. And, uh, you know, I think just working in video, uh, with cameras and, you know, even just in post, whatever it is, like anything to do with video, like it's just a great thing. So (laughs) I don't know. I think I would I would take the industry job over um, the non-industry job personally, also for all the things that you said too, because the connections like you you make a lot of connections when you're in that kind of world. Yeah, I think I really do think networking is vital. I mean, even if it's not directly leading to you getting a project off the ground, like just knowing and having um, a touchstone with other people who are suffering like you are is like a nice reminder that you're not alone out there. But I do think there's, um, you know, I'm not super close with one of my brothers, but uh, when I was going to grad school, he, it was between University of Iowa and USC. And University of Iowa, I would have had like a full ride scholarship. And I actually would have profited from the experience of going to grad school. Oh, wow. Or USC. And I decided USC. And he actually was very, like, pushy. He was like, you should go to Iowa. You need to spend a few years and, like, live and not be in L.A. And actually be surrounded by real people and be inspired by life around you. And I do think that had I been a different person, had I understood how a camera worked and how I understood how the industry worked, then going and working at a pizza place or going and working in an office would be a good um, alternate touchstone because you'd be in touch with like regular concerns. I mean, we live kind of in a dream world in Los Angeles, at least. So I can see there could actually be a benefit to not working in the industry. You understand what people are you understand a different day to day than the culture of hustling over here. I think, yeah, it's like, you know, that is something that 
I talk with my friends about a lot about too is like if you're only working in video production or filmmaking all the time, that's all you know. Like, what experiences are you drawing from to to write about? You know, like yeah. where is your real life experience that you can like actually take into a story coming from? If, like, you'll just only make movies about people who make movies <laughs> if if you drew <laughs> from your own personal experience only. But you know, so that, I think there is some truth to that. But you know, I think it's also if you do have a day job in the industry like get hobbies like you know like i do kickboxing or i used to do kickboxing when you kick kickbox cool. in, in gyms um that stuff is important and i mean i and i used to have i had so many jobs growing up like i did everything you know um when i was in college and before i landed in filmmaking so i have a lot of things to draw from from those days but yeah no i think i think it's just kind of up to you i think the bottom line is like no matter what you choose like it doesn't make making your film easier Yep. Like, let's just like put that, make that clear. <laughs> like, there's no decision that's going to make it easier for you to get your film made. It's hard no matter what you're doing. And it's really on you to do it. So, like, the people who complain, like, about, oh, like, I wish I didn't have my industry job. Like, it would make my life easier. Oh, I wish I had an industry job. I would be able to make my projects. Like, they're, like... To quote, you know, Rashad uh, Nurse of Green said on our last episode uh, from from Spike Lee when like, you know, that the whole Spike Lee story. Yeah. And he's just like, they're all just bullshitting. They're just bullshitting. <laughs> like, like if you really wanted to make your film or you really wanted to like write your script or direct your thing or even star in your thing, there's nothing that's stopping you from doing it no matter what your situation is. Like you yeah. can do it. You just have to do it. Ever since I had a kid, I've been trying to f- suffering with finding time. But I was thinking about this today and I was like, I have nap time every day. <laughs> I don't have to sit and watch Married at First Sight. You know, I could actually sit in front of Final Draft and write. And I have been making excuses. So, yes, it's difficult for everyone. But I think I've also been hiding behind those excuses myself. So I get it. But, yeah, it's good. You're, Ulrich, it's good to, like, remind people that um, it's on them. Yeah, and I think it's cool that we're the hosts of the show because we're both living proof of this. You know, like we're both actively making films and, uh, you know, we, we both have our own circumstances that we could say, oh, it doesn't allow me to, you know? Mm-hmm. And like you have a kid and you're still, you know, working on lady parts. And, um, you know, we've had tons of guests on the show who are mothers and fathers and they still make their films. So it's mm-hmm. just like, you just gotta do it, you know? Yeah, figure it out. Um, so John, hope that's helpful answer to your question. Um, you can check out John at, uh, on YouTube at Filipco video and, and four tall guys, although they're both like defunct, <laughs> basically YouTube pages. They haven't been updated in like years, but the videos on there are fun. So you should check that out. And then, um, yeah, I think at John Filipco on Instagram and stuff too, if you want to find him there. Um, but if you want to be like John Filippo, you can send us a question, comment, or suggestion to podcast at makingmoviesofthar.com, and uh, we'll read it on the show if it's any good, or if it's not just a plea to uh, have you on the show. Um, and then if you like the show, you can leave us a review on iTunes, Spotify, or any of the other places you can leave reviews for podcasts. And then, Liz, you want to tell them about this next part? Yeah, we have a Patreon page. <laughs> So if you really love the show, you want to support us, go over to www.patreon.com slash MMIH podcast. Uh, we love anything you can afford to give. And we have a very cool new brand, new enamel pins um, for a $9 donation. It could be, uh, or sorry, investment in the show. <laughs> uh, it could be a one-time thing. It could be a regular thing. We just want to spread uh, spread the word and we'd love you to have this pen and the bird is the word liz it's such the word so soap dish i'm Lori craven and i'm an actress an actress really how nice for you i'm betsy faye sharon and i'm a bitch so when i was in film school ian sanders spoke to us and he created ghost whisper amongst many other things and he said the big piece of advice, and, and Ian has actually passed since, so um, oh. and I don't know him very well. I just remember him coming and speaking to our course. But he, he said, like, the biggest piece of advice he could give someone in film school was that, you know, look to your left, to you, look to your right. One of these people is going to be a studio head. One of these people is going to be um, a massive, massive success, and you are going to regret any bridges you've burned with them. It's true. And this is a lot of why L.A. gets, you know, it's phony. Um, uh, you know, it's it's called phony very often. And I think it's because people are very, very afraid. They don't know who's going to make it big and who's going to uh, succeed. And so there's always like this hedging of bets and this like phony 
congratulations around every single deadline. <laughs> you know, it's like anytime something is in the trades, you know, that person will get 30 emails from anyone they've ever met because everyone thinks this goodwill will propel themselves forward. It's very interesting. So what I was just thinking about is how... Um, when I did my first Kickstarter for my first feature, Bread and Butter, I was friends with, I'm still friends with this guy named John Conway, fabulous human, and he was dating a woman who had a very massive social media profile. Somehow she saw my Kickstarter campaign link and she decided to share it. And that Kickstarter link share caught the attention of a guy who became a patron of mine for that project and another project. But it was just this one minor instance and, you, you know, I would say my relationship with John Conway, a man I really respect and like, has just come out of like maybe a few minor conversations at parties where we talked about Criterion Collection. You know, like there's nothing very powerful about our connection, but we seem to be like minds. But had I not gone to that party, had I not, you know, exchanged a few kind words with him, had he not had, you know, the, the kindness to share this link with his girlfriend at the time, like all of these things, then I wouldn't have met this patron and they wouldn't have had um, a lot additional support for my first and my second feature. So what I just want to say is like these minor, minor instances lead to massive boons to your career. And you may think, um, I mean, something similar, someone I thought who didn't like me at all invested $10,000 in my first feature. So (laughs) you may think that people do not like you. You may think that they are a colleague or an acquaintance and that you don't, you know, maybe you think they, you know, they didn't laugh at your joke once or whatever it is. Um, Be overly inclusive in social media if you feel comfortable in your email newsletters, in the party invites you give. (laughs) Um, Be kind, be open, and be overly inclusive. You'll never know where where the support of one person will get you. Um, And so try to avoid burning bridges because I think it will bite all of us in, in the butt. I hope I'm not encouraging people to be phony. I just am trying to be, you know, encourage people to be open is what I'm hoping for. I I think the, the, what I, the way I interpreted this and the way that I basically live my life is just, I'm just nice to everybody, you know? And I just like, don't turn anyone down. If they email me or reach out to me for something, or if anyone asks a question, I try to be thankful and I try to be um, humble when I'm in the position of, um, you know, I don't know, like directing my first film, for instance, like I was, it was a kind of incredible position to be in, you know, to be making your dream come true. And I was so grateful to everyone who worked on the film. And I think like, I don't know, just those things like are just good things to do and you should just do those things and you shouldn't expect anything to come from them. But like you say, like good things do come from those things. You know, like I had um, a woman who uh, supported my first short film, uh, Strange Thing, on um, Kickstarter uh, with like the biggest, uh, you know, contribution that anyone gave. And, um, you know, I just kept in touch with her and, you know, gave her her, um, you know, incentive and everything, which is like, you know, production consultate consultation or something, um, something like that. And we became friends and. We've been through ups and downs and she introduced me to somebody who was like, it was like basically a long, terrible experience of us working together. And we were both basically got shafted by this person (laughs) through, through the time. And like, you know, there could have been like, yeah, uh, that person's crazy. They've got me involved with this insane person who like took me through this emotional, terrible experience as a creator. And it was just, or creative, I should say. And it was just really awful like oh i can never trust this person again but no i did not say that i (laughs) you know decided to just be friends with this person um anyways and just you know i don't know i mean just because i didn't hold it i never held that against them you know what i'm I'm saying like i was just like oh that worked out badly too bad for both of us but um you know let's just stay in touch and you know whatever and now that person's a producer on uh, the alternate and did a lot of amazing things, not just for that crowdfunding campaign, but also um, just for the movie in general. And it's like, I never had any ill will towards that person, but there is a version of myself, like the alternate Ulrich per se, (laughs) who could have been very, you know, prideful and hurt and decided to write that person off after that experience. But, you know, that's just not the kind of person I am in general, because that's not how I 
am in the world. And then it just ended up being a good, a, a good outcome, I should say. But I don't, it almost feels bad to say it that way. Cause this is also a friend of mine too, but I just mm. like, I think maintaining friendships is important, you know, just to me personally. And then it also ends up working out, um, for collaborations, I should say, I guess. Does that make sense? You it know? does, I think. And also the fact that you were open enough to trust someone and kind of go on a weird journey with someone they recommended. Right. It's like, yeah, there may have been like a psychic um, fallback for you or, or fallout on you, but uh, but it got you to where you are today. And I think that we get some emails or I get emails and I think I'm – totally thrilled anytime someone wants to email me and oh, yeah. I don't know who they are and they don't know who I am but the goal is to be open right so be open to anyone who who contacts you be kind be positive if you can um and try unless someone really and I have two people in mind that I'm not going to name check <laughs> but unless someone really trespasses on you to forgive and forget and move on um, so don't right. burn bridges and it sounds yes you're totally right this is advice for life but I'd say that when you're in I don't mean to harp on about the LA thing but when you're working in LA life becomes work and work becomes life so they become intertwined in a way that's like really unhealthy so it is an audience building advice <laughs> segments, like. right right and I would say that you know as a person who doesn't live in Los Angeles but also works in film and video and all this stuff it's kind of the same here, you know, like it's, it's sort of, it's not as intense, I would say as the LA experience. And the few times I've been in Los Angeles and my network there, like I definitely, I, I feel all the things that you're saying, you know, and that's yeah. not a very small degree. Cause I'm, you know, not an LA person, you know, but, uh, but we have similar things in the Bay area too. You know, yeah, and, yeah, and I'm sure it's true in in all markets, really. Yay! This went better than I thought it would. <laughs> it was great. Well, you're just so good at this, Liz. What, 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 what can we say? <laughs> you're a genius. You. Oh, God. So, the player. What about truth? What about the reality? What about the way the old ending tested in Canoga Park? Yeah. So, uh, I think two weeks ago, I had I created this. Uh, bold suggestion, so shocking, <laughs> so bold, so shocking <laughs> that uh, we just collect sound bites from from women in the industry to ask uh, to share why they joined the industry, why they wanted to become an independent storyteller. So we're still on that, and we have two speakers this week. And just like a public service announcement, it's a Google form. Um, we'll share it via our social channels if you want to contribute to the podcast if you identify as a woman and you want to share what inspired you to be in this industry you too can be player of the week hi there i'm molly ratterman and i'm primarily a director and writer uh, but an overall filmmaker in the industry i produce as well oh man the first time i decided to become part of the film industry. For me, it was more entertainment. I know when I was three years old, I saw Elton John perform live and it just blew my mind. I knew at that point I needed or wanted to be in the entertainment. But I think for me, it was about finding my medium within the entertainment industry. And eventually I figured out that storytelling through, you know, visual mediums was my way of kind of communicating my feelings, my opinions in the world, um, and kind of perpetuating the importance of storytelling through film. Um, for me, dark comedy particularly. I always had a really hard time expressing my emotions growing up, but film always helped me understand them and give me certain guidance and sort of a compass that actually could really you know, hit close to home for me in a way that I was influenced and I wanted to give that effect to others um, and to audiences and, you know, elicit that sort of entertainment, but also something to take away. I loved that film, gave me something to think about constantly, you know. Um, so that's kind of my journey. It wasn't an exact moment, I suppose, except for kind of a process. Hi, my name is Jessica Jacobs. I am a producer in the film industry and I first started becoming very interested in storytelling as a young kid. I actually went to an acting camp and 
I really love the experience of just stepping into someone else's shoes. Uh, but I soon realized that being behind the camera was more enticing and more just creative for me personally. So I I knew that I wanted to produce when I was going to film school at LMU, the School of Film and Television, and I'd PA on different sets, wear different hats, and I always gravitated towards, you know, creating something from inception to completion. And, you know, collaboration has been a huge part of, you know, my my genuine passion and I guess resilience in this industry as well because I love working with new, whether it's directors, actors, talent, and my favorite thing is to discover new emerging voices, diverse voices, um, and really shepherd them and be allies for them as well. I think being a woman in film is incredibly important and I also love mentoring because it's a very hard industry and that's just another component of the way I collaborate, always trying to help those below me, beside me, and learn from those above me. So uh, without further ado, let's get to Leah. Which project would you want to talk about? Ooh, maybe MFA, just cause it's my baby. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How many days did you shoot? 22 or 23 days with a pickup day. What was the rough budget? It was 250K. And how long did you work on it from the inception to the release? I believe it was about, um, I started working on it in 2000, like, oh, geez, 15, 2014, I started writing it. And then we released it um, uh, Friday the 13th of 2017. And how many people were on set? Too many. <laughs> there were <a> <laughs> too many people on set. It was very hard to move. Um, I will say on our pickup day, it was like five of us. It was so it was so few of us, and we moved really fast. And it was it was like we were all doing crafty and putting together art art direction and and holding lights. I mean, it was like a crazy. But that was the day that moved very quickly. But that was the best day, right? I, I always think pickups are the best days. <laughs> I mean, it's hard because there were so many amazing people and talented people on the days where we had our full team. But but when we were just had it like a skeleton, 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 we moved so quickly. Uh, and out of all your projects, of which there are many, how difficult was this one? It was the most difficult by far, by far, by far. Well, tell us why. The subject matter, the fact that I fool it, was so foolish in thinking that this was like, a, you know, could be made for this budget. And um, it was, it was, I had wrapped up all of my hopes and dreams in the film. And um, I took things that you shouldn't take personal. I took them very personally. And I was really out of my depths. It was my first time producing a feature. And it just so happened that I also wrote it and was in it. And it just, uh, I, I wasn't as prepared as I maybe should have been. But the truth is, I might never have attempted it had I really known what was going to go into it. Well, it seems like a, a, a statement for filmmaking in general, if we really knew <laughs> yeah. what we were going into. Um, yeah. So just to clarify, MFA is feature fiction feature that played South by 2016 or 2017. 2017 and then it was released that same year and how we met because you came to chat about the release of the film at Sundance and um you and your fabulous producer we were just kind of brainstorming one day but how did you end up releasing the film and and how did you feel about it I, I really want to dig into what the, the statement you just said which was that you took things too personally that you shouldn't have but I think let's give everyone just a bird's eye view of what you did first Sure. Um, so I, I came in with my director, actually, Natalia um, Latte, who I love so much. Um, I, I produced it and wrote it, um, and then I acted in it. I Honestly, it was it's a rape-revenge film, uh, which is just inherently difficult and, and uh, requires, I think, a lot of sensitivity and thought and... Um, I think in a lot of ways, bravery and courage, and uh, Natalia had that, and I think for me personally, I felt so much pressure because I had, 
I had put everything into, I had asked every single person I knew if they would help me on making this film and whether it was, um, finance, uh, you know, investing in it to coming to be an extra, to working on it, to, you know, in front of and behind the camera, I had asked everybody that I knew to help me in some way. And I think when, and honestly, that's how you get a movie made, right? When you, when, when it's your first one, when it's an indie film, um, you're begging and borrowing and stealing, but it was, it, it was like something as simple as the co- the cops have been called because the trucks are taking up all of the the um, the the neighborhood's parking and um, and is sort of like blocking the way. The cop the cops are called and you don't have the proper permitting because guess what the city of Orange is not even though it's in Orange County it's actually not technically Orange County it's a historic district which requires a separate permit that you do not have. So we're shutting down, and I know that what's happening indoors is like our big party scene that has many, many extras that are friends of mine that I've asked to be there. And so I'm like outside talking to the cops, crying, getting on the phone with the, the, with the permit guy, you know, and, and it was so funny because I remember that this specific day that I'm talking about, I was just like crying, and, and honestly, it, it might have looked like you know, a way for me, it was like a, a, you know, a way for me to get out of it, but I was just exhausted. And like right. the last thing I needed was the cops showing up and telling me that I didn't have what I needed. And by the time I got off the phone and they were just denied, they were like, we're shutting you down. The cops were like, you know, we're just going to leave and <laughs> uh, we're not going to come back this way. <laughs> and, oh, that's really and, sweet. Um, and I was like, "But I have to shoot here tomorrow, also." And they're like, <laughs> yeah. he goes, "He goes, I'm off tomorrow. Are you off tomorrow?" He's like, "Yeah, I'm off tomorrow too." He's like, "Cool." So um, maybe you just want to like move that truck away <laughs> from this area. And I was yeah. like, "Okay." He's, they're like, "Bye." Wow. <laughs> you, like drive off, and I think they could just see that I was like at wit's end. This wasn't me like pulling out a card and being like, I'm going to play the crying girl card. I was, I was like, this is my movie. You know, I'm the head producer on this tiny film that I'm just like, we're barely surviving as it is. And so it was like the subject matter on top of that, the logistics of making a movie that became much bigger than yourself and trying to manage it and feeling very much that it's all your fault when things go wrong and feeling that you're terrible and the biggest failure in life when things go wrong. And then on top of that being like, how, how, what are the chances that this movie is going to turn out the way that I envisioned it when so many things are changing on a daily basis as they do, which is filmmaking because it's a collaborative process with many minds and you know, everything you're, you're always just trying to stay afloat, even on the big ones. Right. So anyway, was, did that answer your question? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a lot of venting here. It's a lot. It was quite an experience in my life. It was much bigger than a, a job for me. It did the trick. <laughs> okay, okay, um, <laughs> I, I, I hate to pry, Leah, but like, are there any other examples of t- things that you took way too personally that you shouldn't have taken, taken personally? Or just personally enough. You know, okay, so this is an interesting thing to talk about. I'm more comfortable talking about it now than I was in the initial release when I was doing press because it felt I wanted to be really careful to not be disrespectful to Franny, who's the star of the movie. But now, speaking about it these days, it, it doesn't feel like it's in direct, you know, it's it's putting down my film in any way. It's much more just talking about my process as a filmmaker, which was, I had written the lead role for myself. And um, that was always the plan. I always start in all of my scripts. Um, and it wasn't, and that was why I became a writer. I had become a writer to be able to write the roles that I wasn't able to get and that I, and, and really, like, to they were sort of tailored to my strengths at times, you know, and especially with my musical stuff, coming from the music industry, not getting the opportunities I wanted, wanting to be on Glee and not getting that opportunity, and um, writing the kind of role that um, Hollywood either wouldn't get me, give me the audition for or that didn't exist in the marketplace, right? So MFA was something that I wrote for myself because I loved my my story and I I thought okay well now you know I've starred in all of my web series and short films now I'll star in my feature and the truth is I had a window 
I, I shot my film at Chapman University where I went to school and I had had a conversation with my professor who is a mentor of mine, John Bennett, who I love so much and helped me a lot on my script. He was like, look, I can get you the campus, I can help you with this, I can facilitate this, but it's got to be over the summer. It can't be while school's happening. When school's happening, there's too many clubs and teams and, and as you... As you might have seen, I, I can't, I don't know if you guys have seen the movie, but there's a lot, there's like the football field and there's the art classrooms and there's the promenade. There's like so many areas of the school. So it wasn't like I was isolated to one school at all or one area in the campus. So I knew that I had to shoot it over the summer or I had to wait a year. And after a year, who, you know, so many things change in a year. I was like, it has to be this summer. So my window was closing and closing as far as getting financing, finding my director. It was very nerve wracking. And I found this director that I had really wanted. I had wanted her, but I didn't have a contact to her. And it was, it was really not helping me going through, like trying to get through like agents and stuff. Cause you have this little teeny tiny teeny tiny film, you know, and that's partially financed. And, and I knew that I wanted a female director. I knew that I wanted a female director who had been to a top festival and had sold her film. Like that was sort of the criteria and had, and it had to be somebody that I loved, like whose film I was like enamored with. Um, and the truth is that if you are a female director that has made a great film that premiered at a top festival and that sold you're probably not wanting to do another little teeny tiny film, A. And B, a lot of the times you wrote that film. Many of them are writer-directors, and it, it, I, underst I completely understand them having their own stories that they're ready to, to, take, to bring into the world after they've had this sort of break in their careers. So it was difficult, and I found Natalia um, from, I had seen Bear, her first film that premiered at Tribeca, and I liked her a lot, but it was hard to get to some of these directors with this tiny film, and it just so happened, we asked around, and uh, a friend of ours had worked with her and knew her and um, set up, you know, set her the script. Her and I set up a call, and... She was, she was looking for that next thing to bite her teeth into. She had had a sexual assault experience in art school herself. Um, and she just had this sort of cosmic connection to it. And the one thing that she asked me for, um, her one like demand, I hate that word that feels demanding, but her one, you know, ask was that she had been really helped by the fact that on her first film, it was Paz de la Huerta and um, Diana Agron from um, Glee. Mm -hmm. And those names meant that, like, CAA got behind it and, and you know, she got some great press and um, they had a really cool, like, vibe together, uh, being kind of namier actors that you would never see working together um, in the same project necessarily. They, like, really had a cool vibe. And she wanted an actress that w had maybe had some namier value. And she wasn't forcing me into this. And I remember, you know, Shin, my, my head producer in my mind and my heart, um, who was my mentor, was like, we don't have to go with her. Like, if that's... If you want to star in this, we can choose a different director. We understand what she's saying, but, like, this is your film. And a lot of people said that to me. But the truth was, by this point, it was, it was more important to me to get my movie made than for me to star in it. And that was, like, the choice that I made. And that was what I, I was determined to do. And I said, then I'll play Sky, you know, uh, which was a role, the second female lead, that I, and I loved her a lot. So we went into casting, went into casting and finding the right Noel. Um, but, but so sorry, this is a very long story, but getting to the point, which is the entire process from casting to shooting a film with somebody else playing the role that you wrote for yourself and that you envisioned in your head how you would do it and, and all kinds of stuff. That's tough and it's painful. Yeah. And, and Franny is brilliant and a, 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 an incredible actress with a lot of natural talent and I love her face and I love 
her face when I'm working with her. I love her face when I see her on screen. She's got this really unique edge and vibe to her that I, I think in many ways I don't have. And, and I, and I just, I'm very thankful for her work, but it was still difficult. It was still really hard at times. And, and the truth is you can't win with a writer that, that, that was planning on playing a role that you're now playing, because I think whether they know it or not, something has been taken from them. And even if it was at their own hand, it's a grieving process that there was no space for me to do privately because I was there holding down the fort every day. But I think I felt really heartbroken if I was crying outside with the cops and couldn't see the scene being shot because I would see it after the fact and feel heartbroken that I wasn't there for that or that I wasn't a part of that. Um, which is the case with producing. Yeah, but you're providing such an important role by doing that, talking to the cops, you know, and handling those things. Like, I think, you know, it's just um, it's just hard. It is hard to be away from your movie in that way, but I always like to think that I'm, even if I'm parking cars in the snow while they're shooting right. a scene, you know, <laughs> right. it's like I, I, I'm doing that because I have to in order for the movie to get made. And as a producer, that's my contribution at that moment, you know? Totally, yeah. Uh, well, Leah, but does that impact the way you work with other people now? I mean, are you writing clauses in your contracts that just kind of protect yourself in that way? Or how did it impact the rest of your projects? Oh, that's such a good question. It really, it, I, I wish I could tell you guys that it, like, it has ushered in this new, like, beautiful chapter in my career where I stand up for myself. Honestly, I think it, it did. And again, this isn't, I, I really don't want to disrespect my film or like my actress. I love both of those things, but I think it did take a, a big hit in a weird way, in a weird way. It did take a big hit in my confidence as an actress mm -hmm. because I, even though I had made this decision I think in a lot of ways, the people, people started to know me from, from MFA and not necessarily my previous work. So I think people were like, she doesn't need to star in her stuff or that mm. she doesn't star in her things. And I had always starred in my stuff. So when the conversation comes up about me acting in my bigger projects these days, um, it's, it can get tough. It, it is not a smooth process. And luckily I have a team behind me um, and specifically a lawyer behind me that knows that this is really important to me and that and that I will sooner walk away from some of these bigger projects if I'm going to be sequestered writing in a corner for the rest of my life you know I'm I'm not built to be with my computer and my headphones every day of my life and that is some last year it was that way predominantly and I you know had to say look I didn't decide to act yesterday. I'm not a writer that's like, it might be nice to be an actress. I think I'll star in this. I, I have always been an actress. I was an actress much longer before I was a writer. I got my degree in acting. I have a lot of acting credits. And some, you know, I'm trying to find that line between where do I put my foot down? And I say, if this isn't, gonna, if this isn't a role that I get to write for myself, then I'm not taking this project. So I have a couple of questions about this sort of going back, like, you know, was one of the reasons why your director wanted um, a star, not just because it would maybe help the movie when it was done, but also to help get the financing, like, or did you already have the financing secured without the star? Like, did that help at all raise the money? Oh my God. We still had the financing coming in as we were shooting. It was the scariest wow. thing. <laughs> it was such bad news bears. Never do what I did. It was so bad. It, and then that was like another thing that's in the back of your head where you're like, is our money running out this week? Like, are we going to have, and it was really Shin, one of our producers really like he put in his own money. I mean, oh, it was ugly, but I will say that the main motivation behind getting a name your actress was not actually in the financing. Most of my um, financiers, it really wasn't about that anyway. It was much more, these were people that believed in the story. These were people that believed in the concept. These were people that um, had daughters or were women themselves and understood in um, the importance of telling stories for survivors. And so luckily it, it was, it was, it did, yeah, it didn't matter much for the financing. 
I just wanted to say that I had a kind of contrary experience to what you'd had, which is um, on my first feature, I was brought into UTA and they opened up their casting books and they said, who do you want to fill your film with? And I decided not to go with their actors and I decided to go with lesser known actors because the lesser known actors I thought were better actors and fit my roles better. And ultimately it did hurt my film to be honest, wow. and it might have hurt my reputation. At the end of the day, I made a film I'm proud of, and I made a film with good performances that like played mid-tier festivals and got like a good distribution deal. And I know you were, like, you're being like so sweet and diplomatic regarding your director, so this is not um, in comment to what you've said, but really just in comment to my experience, which is just like, there are days where I'm like, why didn't I just play the system? Sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I, it is sort of like you and I were in a similar position and you took one route and you, and, and I took the other and I and think you're we've... writing Greece. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm in my bedroom in sweats. So, uh, <laughs> but, but I do, I, you know, it is, I'm with, I'm actually with UTA and it is an interesting thing. Um, and I, I commend you and I think that's beautiful and I think that you will be rewarded and probably have been in ways that are, it's hard to tell, um, at this point, but I, but I think it, we are all faced with that. What, you know, do I do what's best for my film or do I play the system a little bit? Do I play the game a little bit? And, and, and it's hard, man. It's hard to know which way to go. And, and I will say, I think that I chose right for my situation because my film turned out, it turned out, you know. And, and I'm proud of what we did with it, but it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't still like hurt me and haunt me in its own ways. So then the other question is like when it, it was released and it did get into South by Southwest and all that stuff, like, do you feel like Francesca Eastwood being the lead role was the reason why it got into South by Southwest and had the su success it did? Or do you feel like that wasn't really uh, a factor or will you, will you just never know? I think it did. I just think she's so good in it. I think she's better than I would have been, honestly. I think that she was meant to be Noelle. And because it's not, you know, I'm such a big believer that some of, you know, these movie roles that we love, that we see, there's so many actresses that would have, that could have played that role and would have killed it. And um, we always think of it as, you know, there's only one Marty McFly. Yeah, there's only, there's only one you know, I mean, technically there's whoever. two, but yes, <laughs> <laughs> there's only one in our hearts. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> there's um, only really one. <laughs> there's only really one, but like, but I, but I'm such a big believer that there's so many amazing actors that could play these roles and that you just, you, we get attached to the version that we, um, that we see on screen. And, and the truth is I, I too am that way. I have almost forgotten the day where I saw myself as Noel and and that vision has been so replaced with Franny as Noel and we got so much amazing press saying how incredible Franny was and that she even in reviews that weren't particularly glowing of our film it was they were always glowing about Franny and I'm really proud of her and I'm really proud of her performance and and I have um I, I don't regret my decision at all to step aside and let Franny take that part. I believe that it was meant for her, and I believe that she, we got it to South by. We had some of the success that we had because of her and her performance, and Natalia directing her performance. We have, like, dozens of questions for you, but I'm, like, chomping at the bit to hear how Summer Lovin' happened. If you, can, <laughs> oh, yeah. Can we dip into that? Is that okay, yeah. Eric? Let's do it. Let's okay. do it. Let's do it. I mean, just tell us. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, for the people who don't know what we're talking about, like to set up what is Summer Lovin' too. Yeah, I'm going to do that. So, but I do think it, it's, it feels like this one moment that happened much before Summer Lovin' is sort of the moment. I, I, and I feel like for me, it bugs me when I listen to, like this really bugs me. I wonder if this bugs you guys. When I was trying to learn how to finance a feature film, I was reading every article and like anything I could get my hands on, how do you finance a movie? And it was like, everybody was just kind of like, you're going to go out there and you're going to find financing. And, you're gonna, and if you work hard, you're going to find financing. And I was like, yeah, but like, how do I do that? I need you guys to get really specific with me because I don't know how to do that. And it would annoy me when I would listen to these interviews where nobody was actually answering the question. 
<laughs> Do you know what I mean? We try to be as specific as we can on this show, like with our guests and then also talking about our own experiences as well. Um, but, you know, as you know, it's like, you know, besides saying you met this person from this other person and this other person. Right. And then they happen to say yes after you right. emailed them 20 times. It's like. <laughs> I don't know. What else do you say, really? But I want to hear that, though, that you emailed that person 20 times. What did you say in those <laughs> right. emails? Do you know what I right. mean? Right, and right, And you guys true. on this podcast are actually awesome and do get to it. And, like, how do you break down this budget? And, how you know, how did you pay for this? And you guys are really great. But but I think for, for filmmakers that are, like, trying to get to this to a certain position, it's, like, get really specific so I know exactly, even if it's not going to be my map, what your map looked like, Um so I'm just going to get into it. But, but oh, I, please. <laughs> so I, you know, I made MFA. I got um, reps off of that. I had already been represented as an actress at APA. So it wasn't like, you know, a big jump. It was sort of like, you got a literary agent. Here he is. I'm like, oh, hello there. And that was sort of like how it happened. Um, but then, uh, you know, I got sent on the water bottle tour of meeting with everybody then I um, met with Escape Art at, oh, well, it's a little bit longer than this, but whatever, we're, we're going we're gonna to focus on getting to Summer Lovin'. But basically, I got very, very intertwined with um, Escape Artist, which is a production company on the um, Sony lot. They do all the cool Denzel movies, Equalizer. Ah, fun. <laughs> and Fences, and um, they have just, like, the coolest stuff. And I, a producer over there, is has become a very close friend of mine, but we met on my one of my first generals. Um, and we, she, you know, we have a TV show together. We... We became very close, and I was writing this, funny enough, zombie pandemic film. And it's a father-daughter drama within the zombie apocalypse. It's a, it's a non-linear in its flashbacks, and so there's sort of like two timelines happening. And it's difficult. The format is difficult, but I cared very deeply about it. It's very much about me and my own father. It's tough. Uh, it's not always rosy. It can get really, um, um, what's the lack of a better word? It can get very tempestuous and, um, I was struggling with it and people were giving, it was my first experience of having a lot of cooks in the kitchen, even in my own kitchen of my manager and my agent and And I was getting a lot of notes and I felt like I was being noted to death and I was losing faith and I was losing my North star and I put it aside to write a rom-com. And it was a rom-com idea that I got just from watching my roommate's stand-up show. Um, another girl said something funny and I thought, you know, my mind kind of like went down this rabbit hole and I got this rom-com idea. And I was talking to Becky, who was my producer <clears throat> at Escape Artists. And I just mentioned, I'm putting aside caregiver. I, I, I'm going to write this rom-com. I just, I just need a moment. I need a break. And she, she goes, what's the concept? And I go... It's about a girl whose best friend is her life, her love of her life, and um, her, 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 it's her little sister, and her little sister passes away from cystic fibrosis, and um, she can't get over it, so she keeps leaving her voicemails, um, and then the number is transferred to this kind of cocky real estate agent, and he falls in love with her through her voicemails and feels like he has to go to L.A. to find her. And Becky goes, great, you're going to send that to me as soon as it's done. Like, as soon as it's done. And I was like, okay. I wrote it in, like, three weeks. And I sent it to her at the same time that I sent it to my reps. And, like, before my reps had even written, read it, it was, like, on Sony's desk. Because they had a first look deal with Sony. And Sony bought it. And, wow. And um, so preempted it. And so before it had even hit the marketplace, Sony had it. Um, and it was funny because I kind of got a lecture, you know, you don't own this anymore. No sharing this. This is, you know, Sony's property now. And I was like, okay. Um, and then it was so funny because since they were attaching talent and a director, and I think everybody was sort of like, what is this original rom-com that Sony preempted when Sony is sort of this tentpole old school studio that does Spider-Man and la la la. Um, and so I think because of that, everybody was like, we need to read it. And then it leaked through the agencies and which was like this beautiful thing in my career because everybody read it. Like everybody read it because I think it was the, the mixture between attaching talent, but also just this curiosity of what this original concept, um, that Sony would have bought was. 
And um, from there, I started getting a lot of um, like rom-com attention, which was interesting because it was my first rom-com. It was never something, a genre that I was like, this is my thing. Like, <laughs> like horror films are much more my thing. Um, I love rom-coms as a viewer, um, but it, it sort of just like spread like wildfire in this weird way. And ended up getting on the blacklist later on, and um, which was beautiful. And, and all these gifts came from the single script that I wrote in three weeks. But what ended up happening was I was struggling through this other, the rights to this other um, project, and it was they were sort of sort of falling apart. It was getting really ugly, and I was my heart was really broken. And the day that this was all going down, I get this text message from my manager, and it says, "Wait, you like Greece, right?" Like Grease the musical, and I'm like, is he kidding right now? Is he joke? Is he messing with me? And I'm <laughs> totally like, one wow. of the best movies like ever. ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm like, he's messing with me, right? And I was like, you know that I played Rizzo in high school. You know Grease is like my favorite movie. And he's like, okay, I thought so. Hold on. And they're like, he calls me up. Paramount had called, and funny enough, Picture Star, which is one of the production companies that also called because they knew me, both of them knew me from voicemails. And I'd actually already met at Picture Star and really loved um, the the um, producer there. She, it was so funny. She had told me that she had read voicemails and that had she'd come out into the like common area of the office, which is this huge, like all the assistants are sitting there. She goes, we're going to buy this movie. We're going to buy this movie. We're going to make this movie. And they're like, it's already bought by Sony. <laughs> she like had this whole big moment and she didn't know that it was, you know, it was just, you know, leaked or whatever. But so she had had this meeting with me and told me that she loved it and, and that was, they wanted to find something. And I was like, oh, thanks. But just funny enough, they ended up getting Summer Lovin'. So, so they had called. They were looking for a big rewrite on the prequel to Grease, which was at the time called Summer Nights. And I did not know who had written the original script. I did not know anything. All I knew was that it was kind of like a big city-wide, business-wide search for who was going to rewrite it and that it was going to be a musical and that um I probably didn't stand a chance <laughs> that was sort of what I knew I mean I thought that like it was great that <laughs> the studio had called it also producers had called thinking of me but you know again I'm sort of only known for one script at this point because most people at this level hadn't seen MFA and uh, you know, this is a script that, that has been bought, but like, you know, has not been made. I mean, this, I'm, I'm like, I think on, on the, in the group of people fighting for the prequel to Greece, I'm like on the bottom, you know, of the barrel. Uh, and I just was ready to go in a battle. And, and I think it began with a pre-call with like the, um, this, was it this? No, with the producers. And I, just, I think I just kind of focused on what I love about Greece and, you know, what is nostalgic about Greece and why Greece resonates. And, and um, we just kind of chatted. And I think I then I got the script and it was by John August. And that really, you know, I didn't know they saw his name on the first page. And I was like, are you kidding? On the cover page, and I was like, wait, is this for real? Oh my and, God. and it was like really watermarked and like deleted as soon as you're done. And it was a whole thing. It, and it had been sent to me. It was going to explode. It was exploding link. Actually, now that I think about it, exploding link. So I could only read it once. So it'll self, uh, deconstruct. It was going to self, wow. yes, it was self deconstruct as soon as you, or self destruct. So sorry. As soon as you read the last page, it deconstructs. Oh my gosh. That's so you funny. Couldn't print it. And oh. it was so, and it, I remember seeing his, and I was like, are you for real right now? Like, now I, it, I think it kind of like set in like, oh, this is like, this isn't some BS little nothing. This is like a legit um, prequel. And so I read it and then I read, I think the studio notes of like what the direction they were wanting to go in. And then it was just like a series, a long series of pitches, you know, and I, I will say, you know, it's funny. I, I'm like, I'm like trying to navigate what I can say. I, I will say this. I was, I got sit down by one of the producers and he, <laughs> he kind of broke it down for me, which was really helpful. He goes, I'm going to explain something to you. Um, 
you are not an attractive candidate for this job. (laughs) Wow. Thanks. (laughs) And I was like, I'm not. And he's like, no, you're not. He's like, I used to work at a studio. He did not explain to me at that point that he had, was like the president of Lionsgate and he was the president of Summit. He was like, he had not just worked in studios, he had been the head of many studios, but um, he goes, I used to work at a studio, so let me explain to you how this works. He goes, there is a list of writers that do big studio rewrites like this. They are foolproof. You call them up. They know how to do it. You are not on that list. I was like, I'm not on that list. He's like, no, (laughs) you are not on that list. He goes, but here's what I know from doing this for as long as I have that the little guy burns you as much as the big guy, that nobody is foolproof. So in my position, you choose the person that is passionate, that, that you trust can get, it, can get us there to the finish line, and you close your eyes and you hope for the best. And I think that you're that person. And so from there, even earlier on in the process, I felt that I had at least the confidence of somebody, you know? And, and, and I had... His, the, the producers on his right hand, I felt that I had them. And so even when I had, you know, other producers to convince, I had the studio to convince, I felt that somebody believed in me. You know, I felt that even knowing that I had never done a rewrite, even knowing that I had one studio movie um, in the works and one TV show in the works, but none of, I was not, you know, I hadn't been validated or verified by the industry yet. My success was still, you know, in question. Um, I felt that he saw me. So as I went through the process, working my way up the ranks, um, in the process, I, I, you know, took coaching. They coached me essentially on what to say and what not to say on, on not just pretending that I had done more than I had done, acknowledging that I was a black horse, acknowledging that I was new to this game, acknowledging that um, this would be my first rewrite, but, but you know, assuring them that I loved this and I knew this inside and out and I knew exactly what to do and I was going to crush it. So that was sort of what guided me, to just acknowledge up front my weaknesses and how it looked, but then to assure them that I had the passion to get the job done. Um, and that was sort of how it happened. And I just kind of kept fighting through many, um, pitches and many meetings and then went to the studio. And by that point you have the producers there with you, you know, backing you up and, and you feel like you're a member of the team and you're not just, you're not playing tennis anymore. You're playing basketball. And, uh, so then, you know, I remember it was funny cause I, I, I went to Paramount and I pitched and I, was really nervous and my and I hadn't eaten breakfast and my stomach is like trying to communicate and being so loud so that I'm getting louder to try to like to try to silence my stomach and I'm like sweating and I'm like pitching from beginning to end like beat for beat with how I would redo it and I'm so nervous and it was literally like a two-hour pitch and I can see my producers are like oh my god she has taken her sweet time and I'm like so nervous I'm like this is not going well but I, I think I, I gotta get it all done I gotta get it all done. And then I, and then I finish and then I go home and I was like, I'm gonna take the rest of the day off. I think that went really well. I got it done. Even if I was loud and my, my, my stomach was trying to communicate. And then I get a call from the guys, from my, my head producers. And they're like, listen, Leah, we want to thank you so much for your work. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, you're not going to be going to see Wick, Wick is the president of Paramount. And I was like, (laughs) I'm not. And they're like, no, we're so sorry, but you've done an amazing job. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, cause you're going, you're going to a draft. You got it. La la la. I started, oh. I started crying on Man, the that's, phone. <laughs> that's pretty messed up. <laughs> that's really messed up. Sorry. But that was a very long story, but was that specific enough for you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a couple of uh, questions. Um, how long did that process take? Like how many pitches and interviews and training did you do? And like, how long did it take? To it was get to months there? guys. It was months because I remember 4th of July. I don't think that I had had my first pitch 4th of July, but I remember being in Tahoe and I was, I had a notes, like I had a notes in my um, phone where I was just asking my girlfriends, what do you, re- 
remember about love at 16 years old? Like, do, what do you remember about your first, like, boyfriend? What do you remember about being in love as, as, as a teenager? And I'm adding all these, like, notes. So those 4th of July was, like, right around my first pitch. And then I got hired, like, two days after my birthday party. It was, like, September, um, I think it was, like, September, like, 11th. Like, right there by September 11th. So, um, July, August, September. So, like, yeah, two and a half months, something like that. Yeah, it's not very long. Also, I want to jump in with this question because I know nothing about studio writing. I actually really know nothing about studio filmmaking other than what I learned from this podcast. But um, <laughs> when you hear that John August has written this draft and you think of yeah. John August as like the world's screenwriting teacher, yeah. can you tell us a little bit about how frequent rewrites are and how even William Goldman and Nora Ephron, like everyone does gets rewrites, right? Or is can you explain like the idea of this seminal writer and and someone editing his work and how this is very frequent, I assume, right? I don't know, to be honest. I mean, it's like everybody's very shocked that John August got rewritten, but he was not. And he was, when I spoke to him, he could not have been lovelier and really um, just so kind and, and not even really, he the way, he didn't even seem like that surprised. And I think it's, he understands the process much more than anybody does and so maybe that was why but I don't know how often this happens but I have been told that these big movies that are these you know these franchisee um you know mission impossible huge style they have a million writers and and it's it's kind of like ushering it through but I think um John August is just he is he's the master and he's one of the like the greatest living writers and it's it, it did feel I did have like the most the intense imposter syndrome like taking his script and and doing um you know moving it a little bit and with my own voice and in and, and my own sort of vision um but I but yeah I think that you got to be a little less precious when you're on these big studio projects because I think hiring a new writer is sort of like the name of the game and I'm sort of like bracing for when that happens to me and um, it sounds like it's a compliment when it happens. It's like you are <laughs> in this great stage and, you know, you can yeah. let go. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I don't think it was at all like, oh, we're going to have Leah on because she is going to clean up some it at all. I mean, John August is the master, I think. For well, you bring was... a different perspective. This yes. is not to devalue you at all. It just, yes. I think when we hear that John August wrote the original script, we're a little bit confused because all of us kind of I mean I don't listen to his podcast but everyone else in the world does and so he's just I a do. name yeah so yeah um so I was just curious I mean maybe Alric you know as well is this are rewrites common in the studio world it seems like it is from what I've heard yeah and then the, the other question I had Leah was when you uh did this whole pitch process for three months did you only get to read the script once or did you get oh multiple God. exploding <laughs> emails <laughs> So I had only read it once and then at a certain point I needed to read it again. So I was like, guys, can I read it again? And then they sent me another exploding. Oh wow. <laughs> and then well, that's finally nice. I was like, guys, I need I really need like a copy. Like, can I please have a copy? Um, and so they printed out a single copy in red pages and they like swore me to destroying it as soon as I was done. And, and, um, it was like a little, and it was like a whole thing that I needed a printed copy, which is so funny, but, but I, and I still have it. I have it in like a secret space because I, because I love it and I love John August and it's, it's special to me and I don't want to give it up and I hope that they don't get mad at me for keeping it. Well, and then when you actually start the rewrite, are you using the script like heavily in your rewrite? Or are you starting from scratch and just doing your own thing with that memory of the script in your head? Well, by the time I got the job, um, John did send me the write the writable doc, um, which was which was um, lovely and helpful. In many ways, I took the pieces and the the parts of the original that I loved and that I was attached to and that the producers loved, and then and then I. I think I did start from a blank document and kind of cut it, pasted the pieces that I knew I wanted to keep. Can you say, like, what percentage of the original draft remained in your draft? Well, I will say, you know, the orig the characters are all the same. The characters okay. from John's version. John's vision of it being, you know, it's 1959 and... He, he has a sort of new direction of uh, there's new characters. Maybe not a lot of the actual scenes and the, the actual, you know, 
dialogue per se, but the entire overarching vision, I think, is still intact. With, okay. With wow. the what it's about and who we're following and and the themes. I'm dying to see it. I, I have a big picture question, if it's okay to kind of take a step back. The way you're discussing your career really feels like you are a player in the system. You have representation. You get pulled in these meetings. You have these terms like water bottle, you know, sesh tour. Like, I've never heard that before. <laughs> these are all things that are fascinating. Oh, you heard that? Wow. No, I don't know oh. any of this. I feel very out, <laughs> outside right now. No, this, don't apologize. This is fantastic. I guess I want to know if you feel you're on a track or if you feel the momentum or if it's just the way you've intellectualized it. Just, I'd be curious to what your experience is like being in the midst of all of these changes for yourself. Yeah, I mean, it. it is. I do feel very much on, on track and it, it is so what they say where it's like be careful what you wish for a little bit because some days I feel really overwhelmed and a lot of pressure and I feel very much undeserving and a lot of imposter syndrome where it's where I'm like I don't even know what I'm doing why are people paying me to do this thing um, and then some, a lot of days I feel really lonely and isolated and that I just miss making my own movies and that I just miss making, trusting myself to make choices when some days it feels like every choice that I make needs to be discussed with somebody else and it feels inorganic to me. So sometimes I really miss my old way of making stuff. <clears throat> but I also, look, it's nice to have paid off my dad. It's, it's, nice, to be, <laughs> it's nice to be able to pay my rent. I mean, it, I feel really blessed that I have closed deals during this pandemic. I mean, it, I don't know a lot of people that like are working more than ever right now. And so there's a part of me that feels guilt about that because, um, because I feel so many opportunities and, and it's nice to have incoming offers as opposed to going out and chasing things the way that I've always done in my career. So yeah, I do feel very on track in that sense, but I, but I will say that sometimes I feel, you know, it's funny because my ex-boyfriend, he was sort of my first view into what it was to be a successful filmmaker. He and I, he was, is my, was my producer on MFA, even after we had broken up previously, um, but we're still very close and I would see him getting up in the morning to go to his TV, sh he would be on a TV writer. He was, he was writing TV shows at the time. And, and I just thought it was so cool that he made great money off of writing TV shows. And, you know, Kevin Bacon was in his show and like, you know, it was so exciting. That world was so exciting. And I remember him telling me that he felt that he used to be a better writer. He was a better writer huh. when nobody knew who he was and when he was doing smaller things and, and I remember that kind of stuck with me and I always kind of went, what does that even mean? And now I know what that means. What that means is you become a part of a system where you learn, okay, this is how you respond to this note. This is what's the note beneath the note and how do you, what, 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 pick your battles. What do you fight for? What do you just, you know, you know, just take the damn note. And, and I struggle sometimes with that. I struggle with wanting to maintain my vision and then having to ask myself, Leah, are you just being ego driven? Like, is this just about you, you re are refusing to, to take off your vision and try somebody else's on for a second. And I struggle with that a lot. And, um, so I guess, I guess the dream is to have a bit of both worlds, a bit of my indie, you know, spirit where I, for better or for worse, make a choice and stick to it and maybe it works and maybe it doesn't. And then also, you know, getting to, to make movies on the scale that the studio system gets to make them. And, 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 and that's what's really hard. I killed myself to make MFA and, and, and that was not a sustainable way of working, the way that we made MFA. That was not sustainable. I was almost, I lost a lot of weight. I was very unhappy um, and I was drained by the end of it. Um, but right now, some days I don't feel creative and I'm struggling to make everybody happy. And sometimes I, I'm like, where is my happiness within all of that? But then I also have amazing producers and an amazing team. And I have, I've, I've gotten really lucky on the, the companies and the people that I work with. So I don't really know what the way is. I'm still navigating it right now. 
I mean, thank you for that honesty. That's like a lot of yeah. vulnerability for one for one statement. I'm just a quick follow up is um, what about acting? Where are you there with 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 acting? It's tough right now. It's really tough right now because you know I've realized I don't really have a lot of interest in going and doing an arc on you know, Hawaii Five O. I, I, <laughs> I, it's just not who I am and no disrespect to Hawaii Five O or the actors that, you know, do more, you know, network jobs. Cause the truth is that as an actor, you don't get to choose and, and, and you're just wanting to work. And the only people that get to choose are like the Angelinas of the world. Right. And right. everybody else is just happy to work. And, and, you know, you make some good ones, you make some bad ones and, that's what it is to be an actor. Um, and I realized that I just, that kind of powerlessness is just not what I want to, how I want to spend my life. And so that has led to me being much more choosy about the kind of stuff that I go out for since I only, and I, you know, to me, it's not about money. I, I will work for nothing if it's a cool, you know, director or filmmaker, like writer, if it's something that I believe in, it's really not about the money. Um, it's about connecting the dots and, um, but that's tough to know. It's tough to know what's, what's, what's going to work, what's not going to work. And, um, so it has led to, to my auditions just completely dwindling and it's hard because I, cause I can very easily get swept up into my writing because I have so much to do. And there's even aside from the assignments that I have on my plate, there's, there's scripts that I want to write, that ideas that I have that I want to bring into the world. Um, so I do feel that the past year it has been, I, you know, I said to my, it's so funny. I, after 2019, very heavy year of writing, I said, you know, 2020, I'm going to be on set. <laughs> uh. <laughs> 2020 is the year that I'm going to find the balance between acting and writing. And obviously that has not happened. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I, I think the answer is, you know, fighting for the roles that I have written for myself in my own projects. I mean, it's, you know, my producers on Greece know I have a role that I wrote for myself in. Oh, 11. really? Yeah. Oh, wow. It's not a huge role, but it's a really cute role. Where I That's get... probably smart, though. You know, make it something that they could say yes to, right? Yeah, <laughs> totally. And I don't want to force myself into anything that I don't belong in. And let's be honest, they're young. They're, you know, 16, 17. And, and um, I'm not going to force myself into any of that. So it was sort of finding a place that somebody like me would exist. And, uh, and, and, you know, I have a role in every single one of my projects, whether I get, I win out in that or not. And you're right. There are clauses in some of my contracts that talk about me being in the projects, but it's very difficult in early development stages to sort of like fight for something that doesn't exist yet. You know, if the role doesn't exist or it's going to exist in episode three or whatever, it was a whole, you know, it becomes a whole, difficult, ugly thing. And at what point do you just say, okay, we're just going to deal with it when it comes. And does that, is that, is that smart to do that? Um, but I have told, you know, it's so funny because I, I get in these moods and I'll text my producers and I'll be like, you better put me in one of your other movies or I'm going to quit writing. I'm going to quit and I'm going to leave <laughs> because I miss acting. I miss sitting in my trailer and eating breakfast tacos. That's what I want to do in my life. That's <laughs> and so you guys funny. are like keeping me in a cage, making me write all day. And look, you know, they've made it very clear at, at, with my reps that like, it's time, you know, maybe it's time to write your flea bag. Maybe it's time oh. to, to write what is that vehicle for you because then we'll go and package it and get it made. But, like, you have to come up with that. So that's definitely whirling around in my brain. So I have one more, like, specific question about Summer Lovin' just because you talked about how long it took you to get the job. How long <laughs> did it take you to actually do the job? Like, you know, what was that timeline like? It was fast. It, it wasn't... Look, and here's the beauty of it, right, is that it's a moving train. It's moving. And... I got back, I got to work immediately on it and um, it was finished before Christmas. So wow. I worked on it, sent in um, sort of an earlier draft, got notes, did another and by before Christmas. So I was like done, done with like all of my work for the year, like a couple weeks before Christmas and just like partied and had fun and just like <laughs> relaxed <laughs> and like did nothing which is so which would like now I'm like oh my god that was amazing but and and I actually already had my first zoom with a director on Friday 
Um, oh, wow. So, and, you know, we were talking notes on changes to the script, so it looks like I might be headed into a director's rewrite on, on, on Grease now. Once... Oh, that's awesome. Do you think they'll bring you on set to be the on-set writer, or do you think that's, like, completely up in the air at this point? I mean, hopefully I'd be on set as an actress, and then I could be on set the other days yeah. as a writer. You know, that's the hope. Um, That'd be amazing. Oh, my God. I... You know, and I've told them, and my producers on Greece are, are the best, and they, I mean, look, we spent a lot of time together before I even got the job, and they know how much I love it, and, and that it's, you know, nobody needs to pay me. This is a dream for me, and the money was really never even a thing at all. I would have done it for free. I would have paid them <laughs> to get to do it. <laughs> so so as much as, as much as they'll have me, you know, it's very exciting for me to be headed into the new direction with the songs, that's going to be really special. And that's something oh, that wow. I, you know, have made, I've, I've kind of muscled my way into that conversation a little bit because I love the music of Greece and the songs are everything. And so I'm just hoping that they, I'm very, I feel very blessed that they're continuing to keep me in, in, in the conversation with the new director and the and new rewrite and, I'm just going to hang on for dear life, guys. <laughs> you should That's mandate awesome. that Freddie, My Love, and Mooning be incorporated into <laughs> right? the prequel. Right? Yes. It's so funny because I think there's some like red tape as far as what came from the musical, the stage musical, and what is owned by the movie. Um, uh. There's some like red tape there, and we haven't really gotten into it, but... Um... But I know that it's much easier if it came from the Paramount film than if it came from exclusively from the from the stage musical. I am so excited. Um, <laughs> yeah. We should wrap up. But Arik, did you have any last well, questions? I just wanted to acknowledge something that, like, you know, you're, 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 what, you, what we just talked about for the last hour was basically like the dream story yes. of Aww. everybody. <laughs> like, you know, you make your your first feature. You know, uh, you you toil, you sweat. It's tough. It's hard. I just went through it on my own first feature in December. Awesome. Um, so Rad. a lot of what you said what resonated with me. We had cops called on us too, and. <laughs> You know, we got through it. Um, and so, yeah, it was and it was really hard. It was a very challenging experience, much more challenging than I thought it was going to be, because, you know, after you direct seven short films, you think, oh, yeah, I can do a feature. And then it's like it's not the same. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's so true. But but I just want to say, like, you know, you finish this feature, you get reps and now you've, you know, written Summer Love in the new Grease like prequel or whatever. It's like. Oh my God, <laughs> like you're living the dream. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. That's so nice. And then like, I don't know, it's kind of interesting with the layer of, you know, the whole acting thing of starring in MFA and then not starring in MFA and then like where your career has led you from there. But uh, I think ultimately it's like you have so much freedom in a, in a way because you can do all the stuff that you're paid to do and like ride that train, but you can also keep on doing the indie thing and you're just so much more better off for it in the end. You yeah. Know? Totally, totally. Yes, that's so nice. Thank you so much. I, <laughs> it's it's hard to look back sometimes because you're like, what what just happened very quickly? Yeah. Well, we really appreciate your honesty yeah, and being you. so open because not everyone would be so willing to talk about it in the way that you did. So. Oh, I'm thank glad. You for that. I hope I'm just. <laughs> I just hate those interviews where people like say nothing the entire time and just kind of like <laughs> are jerking off to themselves a little bit. And I and I'm yes. just like I really don't want to come off that way because I I feel like I'm such a South by indie kid through and through and it's such a weird like journey I've been on the past like couple years that I. Uh, even I'm like, I don't even know what's happening. I'm just trying to hang on to your life. It's <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> well, the nostalgia is not done yet because we like, we started to do this thing where we end the show with a final five questions, but they're more of a big picture look at everything you've accomplished. Okay. But I'll let Ulrich start off. So what's the first film you ever made and how do you feel about it now all these years later? I, I think the first thing that I saw from beginning to end was Destroy the Alpha Gamma as my web series. Um, it's a musical, and I starred in it, and I wrote it, and I produced it. And the way that I feel about it now is very um, proud but embarrassed. <laughs> it's a, you know, it's like a lot, and it, it's a lot of me, and, and it, it's, it's not for everybody. And I thought it was like 
you know, Schindler's List when I made it. I thought it was like the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> it was Casablanca. I, I thought it was so incredible. And now I'm just like, I cringe a little bit, but I'm very proud of like all the work that went into it by all of the artists. So proud, but embarrassed. What's the best filmmaking advice you've ever received? Uh, to build it and they will come. Do you have a goal as a filmmaker? Yeah, I want to be like Reese Witherspoon and just do whatever I want and star in whatever I want to <laughs> and, and have everything turn to gold and, you know, sometimes just produce, sometimes, you know, she doesn't write, but sometimes be behind the scenes and sometimes in front of the scene, in front of the camera and um, have not, not really have anybody questioning when I decide to act and when I decide to to be behind the scenes. If you could go back in time, what's one piece of advice you would give yourself? Ooh, to not have so much pain and anxiety and worry about where I'm going to end up, that hard work is going to pay off and to just focus on the day and not be so hard on myself about where I am in life. And finally, is making movies hard? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is harder than making movies. Making movies is the hardest, but the most worth it. Aww. Love it. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. <laughs> and then uh, where can people find you? Like if they want to hear more about you or talk to you or reach out to you, like you have Twitter, like you have a website, where should people go? Yeah, hit me up on Instagram or Twitter. It's just at Leah McKendrick. Um, yeah, all my stuff. I, I'm like, I think I'm like the only Leah McKendrick, so I'm kind of everywhere. I got my website, Leah McKendrick. Dot com. Yeah, wherever you want to hit me up, I'm happy to hear from you. All the cool people refer to Instagram first. I need to learn to yeah. do that. That's like the <laughs> signature of cool. Yeah, it well, is. Well, I went on Twitter the other day, and this girl had read voicemails, my, my, my blacklist Sony script, and was like, did this whole thread about how much she hated it and how oh. whack it was. What? Oh my God. And how like she hated all the characters and how like whoever had it needed to do like lots of rewrites. And I was like, yep, won't be going on Twitter for a while. <laughs> oh <laughs> no. <laughs> Damn. Like, Instagram it is. It doesn't force oh. me to see what the haters think of me. Evil. The hate is real on Twitter. <laughs> the hate's real. <laughs> Thanks for listening. And thanks to Leah McKendrick for being on the show. You can check out her film MFA right now on Amazon Prime and her film Pamela and Ivy is online as well. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out for sure. Um, you can also check out our website, makingmoviesishard.com, where you can find links to the things we talked about on this episode. If you want to get in contact with us, send an email to podcast at makingmoviesishard.com. Find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at MMIH Podcast. I am Liz Manishow on Twitter. I am Auric B on Twitter and Instagram. Amazing. If you like the show, tell a friend, help us get the word out, leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And finally, last but not least, thanks to our producers, Greg Holdsman, Joshua Sterling Bragg, editor Allison Stoney, and the whole Bloodstream Media team for making this, this episode possible. And we will talk to all of you next week. And I literally just let my cat out because he was scratching to get out. I closed the door and now he's scratching to get in. Is that so, <laughs> is that so quarantine life? Just come in. That's um, just cat life. <laughs> that's know? just cat life. That's not quarantine life. That's just any day being a cat. <laughs> I have two cats so I can understand. They're so insane. <laughs>